Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. Now joining us to talk about the meltdown on Monday of the global finance markets is Eve Smith. Eve is the founder of NakedCapitalism.com. Thanks for joining us again, Eve. Paul, thanks so much. So here's, explain this to me. On Friday, we have the downgrading of U.S. sovereign debt by S&P. On Friday and all over the weekend, all the commentators were saying, this is politically motivated. Uh, no one's going to stop buying treasury bills because of this. No one believes the U.S. can default, so on and so on. And in fact, I heard one of the money market managers on uh, TV today saying he thought on Friday not much would happen on Monday, except all the big institutional investors started selling like mad. So why? Well, this is really a stock market reaction, not a bond market reaction. If you look at what happened in the bond markets, the the and we probably need to back up sort of to one high level of abstraction. But what happened during the day was in fact the treasuries went up. They had weakened somewhat overnight, but all of the central banks had basically said that they weren't going to give up buying treasuries. The major money managers had said they weren't going to give up buying treasuries, and that the um, and that most people expected that there might be some uh, uh, panicked selling by people who were blindsided by the downgrade, and that once that the um, that interest rates had gone up high enough, that other buyers would swoop in and buy them. Now, what inst what instead happened is that remember everybody in the U.S. is very fixated on what's happening here. The much bigger story, frankly, and what appears to actually be the trigger, even though it's not being reported that way in the popular media, is what's happening in Europe. The, uh, the Spanish and Italian bonds, um, and those are, Italy in particular is too big to save by any standards. Those bonds started widening very significantly on Friday. And that was because the ECB had basically said that it wasn't going to support the debt of those countries. That it okay, let just quickly, let me just say, widening means the interest charged rate, on rate, these... It go, goes up, which means the prices go down. So here you have sovereign governments, and they're spread over Germany, which is, which is now perceived to be the benchmark funder in that um, group, w went up tremendously to the point where it would cause the government's problems. They all have... They all have debt that they're going to have to refinance at some point in the next year or two. Um, and the irony is with Italy that it really is much more of what you, would, what, the, what you would call a rollover risk problem than a solvency problem per se, because they, even though they have a very high government debt, almost all of it is bought by Italian savers. But still, if the market interest rate is really high, the Italian savers are going to expect that when, they're, when their bonds mature and the government sells new bonds, that they're going to get those high interest rates. So... Uh, in any event, so, so the important thing was for the European Central Bank to step in and demonstrate some support, that there has been, uh, because there's a big difference between a liquidity crisis and a solvency crisis. If people panic, you need a central bank to step in and provide liquidity to calm the markets. If you've got a real solvency crisis, which is what we're seeing in Greece, you need to go down a different path. You need to basically restructure the debt, which isn't happening in Greece. So we're not doing the right thing, <laughs> they're not doing the right thing in Greece, and then, which has already got people alarmed. And then we have the problem spreading to Italy and, and Spain, and the ECB has been sitting on its hands. So over the weekend, they had a whole series of panic meetings among the G7, and, and I've heard from people who know staff at the ECB that there are increasingly bitter fights at the board level about what to do. And the, over the weekend, they announced that they were going to buy bonds. Well, the market's open in Europe. They just didn't let me, buy just bonds. Let me quickly say, for those that aren't following, ECB is, is, is European Central European, Bank. Right? And, right. So the market's open in Europe. The ECB, now the markets had behaved badly overnight, in, but not that badly, frankly. I mean, given that the downgrade surprised people, 2 to 3% down is bad, but it's not a, I mean, it's not a disaster. I mean, that's sort of at the, at, at the low end of a bad daily move. Um, and the European markets opened down 2 percentish. Um, and the uh, central bank initially, ECB, didn't come in and buy. And then in the middle of the day, it did do some buying, and the markets actually went up to almost flattish, and then it stopped, and they started, and they started decaying again. They just started decaying in a very serious way. And then the U.S. markets basically opened up in sympathy with what was happening in Europe. They had been, they had been overnight down um, about 2% to 3%. They opened down about 3%. Um, and then what happened during the day is they sort of stayed around the 3% level. Then Obama speaks, and the market started tanking from there. It went down during his speech. 
um, rallied a little bit now, afterwards. This is his, con- his confidence building speech. His confidence speech shot the market in the head. I mean, his confidence speech, the, 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 the DK at the end of the day, the, the, the Obama speech, no question made matters worse. I mean, because it basically demonstrated that he was out of touch. So not- if you go into the process of this, this kind of movement means big institutional investors start selling. And they, they all know that if they start start this, it's going to lead to this big, what we saw, a big drop. Actually, not necessarily, because remember, 70% of New York Stock Exchange trading is not this crazy algorithmic trading. So well, it's really not people with, it's not really people with brains. I mean, that's the whole thing. This, this could, you know, very well be that the algos, and this, a different version, same thing happened in the 87 crash. You again, the, the trigger of the 87 crash was in fact a completely different form of automatic computerized trading known as program trading. And that, and, and uh, so I, I haven't seen any analysis of actually what happened during the day, but frankly could be that people got nervous during the Obama speech and then, the, as they called them, the algos kicked in. Well, so I, I was talking to someone, uh, actually uh, Bart Chilton, who's a commissioner of the uh, Federal Commodities and Derivatives uh, Commission, and he was he said to me that of thirty five thousand people working at Goldman, one thousand are working on algorithms. Yeah. So this this could be that kind of play. On the other hand, you don't let that kick in unless you, I mean, can is it you don't turn it over to that unless there's something yeah, in it for un- you. I mean, unfortunately, th- unfortunately, you do. It's highly automated, pattern based trading, and they're trying to beat other people by nanoseconds. So, in fact, it, now at Goldman, they may, there may be some shops where they actually have some form of manual overrides, but, it, but at a lot, a lot of the shops that do this are actually um, boutiques that only do this kind of trading, and it's highly automated. So there are a lot of players which I would doubt they have any kind of man, o- overrides on their systems. Well, one of the commodities traders I was talking to a few days ago, he, says to me, he, he said to me that part of what goes on in these kinds of enormous drops is the big players don't mind the drops because the small players get wiped out and the big players sitting on cash buy back in. Do you think that's a factor here? Well, no, that is, I mean, I was, you know, I just spoke to somebody who's a, uh, late this afternoon, a, a world leading derivatives expert, Satyajit Das, who's actually based in Australia. And he was saying this is the kind of market traders love. They make a lot of money on volatility. This is a perfect market for, for those kind of big, you know, those kind of big um, aggressive traders. Right. So, uh, what do you think should be done? I mean, uh, I saw on Naked Capitalism, you, you wrote a, a piece called o- Obama Does Own This Crisis. So, why do you say that, and what could he have done differently? Well, the big mistake he made was letting, this, letting the debt ceiling crisis even occur. I mean, because, frankly, if, if you recall, Obama came into office literally before he even, the week he took office, he was talking about entitlement cuts. This was something he wanted to happen on his watch. Um, and so when the Republicans uh, were, ironically, in, in the wake of the Obama victory, the, the Republicans were strategizing on what they could do to gain ground, and they wanted to make something out of the debt ceiling crisis. There's an excellent story in the Washington Post that I'm sure a lot of your readers saw over the weekend on that. Um, Obama played right into that. You know, he had, he had roots. Where he could have circumvented the debt, and he could have first could have called a bluff early on. Yeah, in fact, John Stewart had a great clip of an Obama press conference where a journalist uh, over a year ago asked President Obama, when they were negotiating the Bush tax cuts, whether he was going to follow the advice of those who were saying, if you are going to make a deal to extend the tax cuts, you should at least connect it to the debt ceiling and don't allow the debt ceiling to be used against you a year from now. So it wasn't like he wasn't aware of this as a possible strategy. Oh, exactly. And then, and then to top it off, you know, it was discussed numerous places that he had several ways out. You know, one was, a, one was a, using the 14th Amendment. Um, he backed off from that, claiming that his lawyers advised him he couldn't use that. Well, ironically, one of the lawyers he pro- who acted as a human shield, Lawrence Tribe, who's a Harvard constitutional law professor, wrote a very strange New York Times op-ed. It was very peculiarly worded. And then Tribe himself has basically subsequently said that, uh, oh, gee, there's no point of entry for anybody to challenge this legally. Right. So in fact, in fact Bill Clinton said he would have used it. Right, and then and then he had other routes that were um, more um, unusual, but were viable. I mean, one of them would be to have the the feder- to cancel the debt held by the Federal Reserve. That would be controversial, but that was theoretically an option. And the other one was this route, which is called coin seniorage. It's a very um, unfortunate term of art, 
but basically the U.S. Mint has the ability to create platinum coins, and they can put any denomination on them they want to. So they could create one little coin, call it a trillion-dollar coin, sell it to the Fed. The Fed would have to pay the mint for it, and the profits would be swept into the Treasury. Right. So, um, so now, now that they made the deal, now that the markets have you know, spiraled and, and the consequences of this, I guess we, we don't know yet, uh, the debt rating is certainly going to affect, if not really the feds, but it could really affect state borrowing, municipal borrowing, and the ripple effect of this downgrading, which affects everybody's social programs. Uh, what, what, what should people be demanding? What, what, what would be the alternative policy right now? Well, the problem is he's again painted himself in a corner. I, I, I hate to say it, he's left himself with, uh, this is why, why I said Obama owns this. I mean, if it were somebody other than Obama, they could go to the Republicans and say, you know, we're going to increase spending. Well, he's bought the premise. He's bought and pushed the premise that we need to cut deficits. This is the wrong time to do that. You know, the time you do that is when the economy is good. And since governments tend not to have the discipline to do that, the best way to address uh, problems in times when the economy is weak is through programs like food stamps, programs like unemployment insurance, so that when the economy gets better, those automatically the spending on that automatically falls off. That way you don't have to worry about government discretion in terms of the spending going down when the economy improves. Um, but he's basically painted himself into a corner. I mean, the only, the only thing that the um, government can do at this point, really, is... is uh, action by the Federal Reserve, and that's when interest rates are this low, there are limits to what they can do. I mean, they, 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 can, they can possibly stabilize the markets. I say possibly because the, with the Tea Parties in charge, I think people are, are less confident in the ability of the Fed to, to stand up and do, do the sort of stuff that it did in the crisis um, once again. So g given the reality of the politics, uh, what do you think is going to happen the rest of this week? Um, uh, well, unless we have some pretty dramatic action, I mean, I could, I could, now, uh, the flip side is, uh, I could easily, uh, I see a lot of panic right now. I mean, the flip side is when people say that the markets are oversold, and I think if there's any excuse, um, you could see a, sh a short-term snapback rally. I mean, that was one of the things we saw in, in the crisis. I mean, this is, this is, we're still not to crisis, even a 6% stock market decline is, is gut-wrenching. Um, we saw even bigger declines during the crisis. In uh, so, we're we're, but the, one of the characters of the crisis was violent snapback rallies. You know, you have these sort of one-day enormous rallies as well. So, I the one thing that's pretty certain is we're going to have a, a, a wild ride until people start feeling more confident that the officialdom is is in charge and has a plan for doing something intelligent. I mean, even if it's a plan that's sort of long-term frankly, isn't very positive. They want to see some demonstration of leadership, and that's what they didn't see when Obama spoke, and that's what they didn't see from the ECB today. I saw a, a guy on TV today, a money market guy. He talks about sovereign raiders in Europe, and in the next raid could be Belgium. Uh, if this continues in Europe, I don't see how this change, how this doesn't continue to unravel. I mean, if Europe continues to unravel, this whole thing continues to unravel. But that's the whole thing. Uh, Europe, you know, we have an economic problem. Europe has a, has a a basic existential problem. They've got they've got real political problems about how the the EU is going to work going forward, which make, you know, this, this false deficit crisis. You know, it's like everybody here has decided to put on this crazy hair shirt and won't take it off. I mean, we could take off the hair shirt, um, but we, uh, the, the critical actors have put themselves in a position where not, they're not willing to do that. In Europe, the, the, there isn't, there's even more disarray in terms of the, the number and the complexity of the problems they have to solve to move forward. And, and the banks and don't seem to take. The banks there. don't want to take any of anything on the chin here in Europe or here, for that matter. And that seems to be the underlying problem. Yep. At least one That's of them. Correct. Thanks very much for joining us, Eve. Thank you, Paul. Take care. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.